Welcome to Beyond the Scenes. This is the podcast that goes deeper into segments and topics that already aired on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. This, this, this is what you think, need to think of this podcast as. All right, so Beyond the Scenes is like when you were a kid and you went to the movie theaters, right? You know, we all snuck in the movie. And then you sneak in one movie. And then after your first movie, you sneak into another movie for a bonus double feature. So now you get to watch Encino Man and Sister Act all in one day while eating snacks you brought from home because you only had enough money for one movie ticket. So, yeah, that's what this podcast is like. I'm Roy Wood Jr. Today, we are talking about a piece that aired originally in 2016 about online dating and sexual racism and when dating preferences became a form of discrimination. Roll the clip. As people of color, a lot of our problems stem from racism. And now minorities that are having trouble getting laid are blaming their lack of game on something called sexual racism. Sexual racism. We sat down with very sexy crybaby Zach Stafford, who says that most people trying to smash on online dating platforms are sexually racist. When someone says something like, you know, I don't date black people, I'm um, talking about all black people, that would be referred to as sexual racism. How is not dating someone because of their skin color any different than not wanting to date someone because you're not attracted to them? Not wanting to date someone because of skin color, that's kind of the definition of racism. Like, yeah, but all dating is discrimination. That's what it is. Like, this guy's too douchey, this dude's too short. This woman won't pee on me. I mean... What? Yeah, I mean, she wouldn't pee by her... In the... You said pee on me. Yeah. It's called water sports, if you're looking for a term. I, yeah, I do. You know that. Yeah, I know you know that. All we're talking about is the fact that we do think about race when we're thinking about desire. And sometimes it can be detrimental to people. Today I'm joined by Daily Show correspondent and huge NBA basketball fan and star of music and movies and films, Ronnie Chang. How you doing? I miss you, friend. Hey, good to see you, man. We can come back to the office, you know. Uh, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, well, allowed we'll to see. come back in. If you actually miss me, you would come back in. But uh, Then you know what? It's just good to see you virtually, friend. <laughs> <laughs> We're also joined by the author of the book, The Dating Divide, Race and Desire in the Era of Online Romance, Jennifer Lundquist. How are you doing today? Hi there. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for Thank having you. me. And I apologize in advance if Ronnie and I get to arguing. Just know that that's what we do with each other. It's all in love. <laughs> and lastly, we're joined by certified dating coach, Damana Hoffman. Damana, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Roy. Now, Ronnie, as I recall, this was a piece that you did with Jessica Williams. And, you know, we started talking about the preferences with regards to black women and Asian people on the dating apps. Walk us through this segment and where the idea to talk about sexual racism came from. Yeah, I can't remember where the pitch came from, but um, I think it was sparked by uh, this article talking about the two least desired uh, races on a dating app. So the stats were what sparked the conversation because it wasn't a feeling, it was like some hard data. And as you know, Roy, it's very rare to actually do a double header with two right. correspondents in one piece. So very rare. Right. And and we had we luckily, thanks to um diverse hi hiring policies, we had a, <laughs> a African American woman correspondent and we had an Asian man correspondent, which were the two least desired uh, uh demographics on the dating app. So we were like, this is perfect. Let's go talk about it. So um, it, it fit like Lego. So we just went to go do the piece. We needed to talk to someone with insider information about how online daters behave. Like Christian Rudder. He co-founded OkCupid and wrote a whole book about dating statistics. We looked at who people messaged, who they matched with, who they responded to. So you're like Edward Snowden, but for trying to put peens in the jeans? Sort of, yes. There is kind of a systemic uh, racial bias uh, pretty much in every dating site I've ever looked at. Really? Yeah. For instance, uh, we found that 82% that of uh, non-black men have some bias against black women. 82%? Don't laugh at me. That's racist as <laughs> And Asian men get the fewest messages and the worst ratings of any group of guys. <laughs> When you came to America, what did it feel like to find out that you were amongst the least desired groups when it comes to dating? Now, you're a married man. Let's add that for what? context. <laughs> but how did it feel, Ronnie? How did it feel to know least desired? Okay, okay, relax. On first dating. of all, first of all, that was news to me. Obviously, in Asia, 
Asian men aren't the least desired demographic, I think. <laughs> Although I have no I have no stats to back that up, so maybe someone should do a data study in Asia on, on that. But I guess I can be vulnerable and admit it was like, oh, why it, it felt bad and uh, I was curious why. Um, I also, something instinctively also, I wasn't that surprised. Just the way Asian men are kind of portrayed in media, I kind of um, uh, suspected as much. But uh, but again, it was nice to have like hot data instead of just going off, um, you know, being a, a sensitive vibe and having the hot data and be like, well, you know, the data kind of proves it. So um, what was it did, to answer your question, it didn't feel good. What was um, more shocking? Finding out about Asian men or black women, in terms of, I which mean, group I'm, are you more surprised? Hey, I'm what, we're having an honest conversation here, so if I get in trouble for this, um, sure. But uh, honestly, I was surprised that black women were on the, on the list with us because because uh, we banging, okay? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, for me, uh, as a complete ignorant person, I'm not a sociologist or anything. I tie a lot of this what we're talking about right now the dating preferences to pop culture and storytelling because that's my industry is telling stories and and uh movies and and tv shows and so on so for me like black women are always portrayed um i mean better than asian men in my opinion there's certain heroes in american pop culture like beyonce um yeah, uh, even going uh, back to pam Greer and the foxy brown era right black women so so yeah. because of that I'm not saying I'm right, but I'm just saying because of that, I was surprised to learn that black women were on the on the same tier as us. <laughs> have you have you ever used a dating app? I have. I'll be honest. I'll speak freely. I've lived a life. <laughs> um, have you? No, no. I got I got attached before the dating app boom, so I skipped that whole thing, that whole era Old for school. me. So I had to join dating apps for this segment. You know, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's interesting. Yeah. You've met your wife the old fashioned way through the personal ads in the newspaper. I respect <laughs> that, bro. I met her old school, the old school way, meeting her in, in at university. You oh, can't get more yes. old school than that. College costs yeah. too much to meet a wife now. You yeah. can't do that anymore. <laughs> so, Ronnie, did you download all the dating apps? Yeah, I joined the dating apps for the first time in my life with my then fiance's uh permission i also went to join raya which was like this super exclusive one for hot oh, is that the people. celebrity yeah. invite only yeah, <laughs> and i couldn't get in i couldn't get yeah. in i got all i got all the famous people i knew to like recommend me and i couldn't get in there so i mean that's some bias right there if there's ever a uh, proof of racial bias the fact that i couldn't get in this even though i had i think i got social I, capital i don't want to blow up anyone spot by saying who recommended me but i got some heavy hitters to recommend me for raya i couldn't get in but every i joined grinder tinder bumble everything and just to see what would happen wait why grinder <laughs> we want, hey, you gotta we, see uh, what's going on with gay men too yeah, where's the bias see. let's see where He's the bias a thorough are. reporter over there yeah. <laughs> that's good i put my daily show headshot in it so I think that biased a lot of things because then we started getting a lot of, you know, are you the guy from the Daily, are you the guy, Daily Show guy? At the end of this segment, we actually had a phone number. It's one of the one times when we were experimenting with expanded field pizzas that exist beyond just a piece. And so we had a phone number for people to call in to tell us their stories about racial bias. And we got a ton of phone calls, which was really interesting. And I think we recorded it, but I don't know where that ever went. We never did anything with it, but... We had a bunch of people call in, and some people called in from jail. Some people called in from, I mean, it was it, that was all TV show on its own. Yeah, tell us about racial bias, but um, yeah, uh, dating apps are crazy. I think the only dating app I ever did seriously was eHarmony back when that was the one back in the day. Getting mm -hmm. your forty point personality profile, and basically <laughs> it was like fifty essay questions you have to answer. Yeah, and then. If you like someone's Not picture, like you can see three of their questions. And then if <laughs> they like three of your questions, you can see five more of their questions. And like basically- so even, even the internet was old school back then. You know what I mean? But what yeah. it actually, it created a different environment, I would say on dating apps because the barrier for entry was so yeah. high. Like yeah. you had to have yeah. serious intent if you were going to fill out the 50 point yeah. questions. And yes. it literally took hours. Yeah, college application. We've seen a huge change in the number of people using dating apps just really since, I mean, OkCupid has been, has been around since 2004, but 
Ever since Tinder launched in 2012, that really changed the game because it made the barrier for entry so low. It was free to join. You could just upload a couple of pictures from your Facebook profile or whatever, and, and you were on. And so the, the variance in the variety in the kind of messages you would get and who you would meet expanded. The speed of dating expanded. And so that's, that's when stigma. it got crazy. The, sti and the stigma chaotic. decreased. The stigma, the stigma decreased, decreased yeah. certainly. Yeah. Jennifer, let's start with the base level. Define sexual racism for everyone, and how do dating apps exacerbate this issue? In our book, we talk about digital sexual racism. There is this normalized racial preference that people think of as very individual level preferences. Dating apps and the online digital dating markets are one of the only spheres left in modern day U.S. society where it is perfectly acceptable to articulate, you know, uh, what your preference is, how you might want to, uh, how you might want to limit your searches uh, based on race. So, in education, employment, housing, many other spheres, we know that these are, uh, this is legally wrong and morally wrong. Uh, but in dating markets, it's become acceptable. Where does race fit into the pre-assumed cultural compatibilities? Because I would assume a lot of us gravitate towards a particular race because we believe particular cultural software is already pre-installed, if you will, with certain people. Where does that line stop and discrimination begin? Or is right. it all, or is it all, because we may have always thought, oh no, yes, I'm just into black people. I'm only into that. But has that always been a form of discriminatory behavior? When you think about always, the history in the United States is we had uh, very rigidly enforced anti-miscegenation laws, which kept people from uh, different races from intermixing with one another. Um, so it's very difficult to tell what sort of the natural inclinations would be because uh, so much of our history was about keeping the races, as particularly whites, from mixing with other races. Wow. Um, so that was really one of the questions that animated our research, which was we know that, for example, interracial dating, um, interracial marriage rates are much lower than if you were to randomly, you know, assort the population and um, with one another. And so the question has always been among social scientists is, is this because we live in such a segregated society still today that we just don't come into interaction with one another to, you know, become friends and eventually uh, start dating one another? And how much of this is about preference, right? And so that's why digital dating markets are so such a fascinating space because, you know, in, in theory, there is no racial segregation. Um, in digital dating markets. Uh, and, you know, in, in our case, we had millions and millions of online dating interactions that we analyzed, and we also interviewed 78 daters, and we're able to see not just what they said, but what they do uh, in the online space. Um, and there are um, a lot of preferences that uh, define how people interact with one another. So, you know, they, they essentially bring segregation with them. Do the apps, how do the apps help to perpetuate it? Like, because I guess if I'm if I'm clicking, well, let me use Instagram as an example. Not necessarily a dating app, but it can be if you're courageous enough to jump in those DMs. It's it's an app where you can accidentally click on a picture of a particular thing, and then for the next four weeks, Instagram just shows you more pictures of that yeah. particular thing, even if it was an accident that you clicked on a woman in a bikini and you really love your girl and you wanted to know that. And it's not your fault that all of these extra bikini pictures. I'm sorry. It just, it, how do the apps help to <laughs> perpetuate the issue? Yeah. So in addition to particularly the, the, the larger dating companies that allow people to search by race, et cetera, uh, there's also the algorithms, like what you're talking about. And bl algorithms are really uh, black boxes in terms of we don't know what's inside of them. It's information that uh, dating companies hold close to their chest. Algorithms can both be actually have race in the algorithm, or it can be machine learning, which is what are what is the average user interested in? Or who have you looked at specifically? And then that's all you see from there on out. And then what I'll say, uh, another aspect of digital sexual racism is that you have a setting where um, what's known as online disinhibition effect, where you have people who interact with each other online tend to uh, be much more, say, rude or honest than they would be in a face-to-face -face environment. Mm -hmm. And so you have these desegregated spaces, but then you also have situations where people are being exposed to 
misogyny um, and definitely racial misogyny in many cases. Uh, and so it's not that it didn't exist before, but it's so visible, right? Uh, that I think that that can be just really shocking for especially uh, women in general, but especially, um, uh, you know, Asian and black and Latino women um, on these these sites. And, you know, the fact that it's like such an assembly line, right? Dating can really feel once you've seen, you start to lose your facial recognition ability as you're swiping and swiping. And so I think it's very easy to dehumanize others. So you have all of these factors that interact with each other with fast moving technologies um, that have not only reify and make more visible uh, sexual racism, but also I think are manifesting in new ways. So, Demona, you're OkCupid's official dating coach. Now, this segment is about six years old. What can you update us on with regards to the stats and trends that you're seeing amongst online daters? Is it is it still Asian and Black women at the back of the pack, or has have the numbers increased? Is there a little more equality? Did the Black Instagram squares work, Demona? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to comment on the black Instagram squares, but what I could say we is... We came together, Damon. It's time. <laughs> Kumbaya. We're all in this together. And, you know, especially within the pandemic, we've seen that there's been an increase in online dating overall. And that actually was a tool that helped people stay connected at a time when you, you, you weren't even in, going to class in college in person. So your options for meeting someone were really limited. But as someone who met my own person, I met my husband online uh, way before it was cool, Roy, back in probably, probably when Ronnie was meeting his wife in, in college, I was an early adopter of online dating. And as a black woman, I can say I was not surprised by the stats that came out in Christian Rudder's book and Dataclysm. But what I will say is that those stats, you reported on it on, in 2016, but the, the data is now over 10 years old. So there has been a huge cultural shift overall. And I've always seen dating apps not as the problem. We want to put all of our frustration with dating culture, with the pandemic, with, with, with race, with everything on the dating app, but the dating app is really just the tool. And as someone who is in an interracial marriage with someone that I met on a dating app, I know that it is a tool that actually can bridge worlds when used in that way, but it is an amplifier. And so whatever beliefs that you, you come into dating apps with, those are going to be mm. amplified because you, you it's, it's have it your way, you, you can, you can manipulate the app. You can you can impact the algorithms. I can't give you all the secret sauce, but I can tell you, just like you said, clicking on certain people will will populate the app with more people who look like that. But this is a place where people show up with their biases, with their their preferences, and this is something that in my own practice as a dating coach, I've been unpacking. I wrote an article for the Washington Post on racism and dating because I feel that for too long, we have allowed people to hide behind their dating preference and we have not encouraged them to examine where those preferences come from. This is a problem in America and it's really time that we pulled back the curtain and examine that. Let's go to a break. We'll be right back with more Beyond the Scenes. Jennifer, why do you think people are so hesitant to have a conversation around this? Like, Because does the sex and dating and romance aspect of this make it a factor? Because if you go off a cliff into pornography, oh. it's... It, no, no, but I'm serious, Ronnie. See, Ronnie, see, you're trying to make me look bad. <laughs> no, 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 I'm doing it because of, I remember your piece you did on the racism in pornography. Racism in porn, uh, yeah. yes, and where people didn't like... even want to... Like, no, no, I not want to date black women. See, you knew where we were going. See, that's why we're friends. You're my friend yeah. again, Ronnie. Nice, yeah. nice say. <laughs> but this idea that... It's so taboo because even in pornography, there is racism when it comes to the preference of the type of porn that some people want to see, so much so that porn stars won't do scenes, won't do interracial scenes for fear that it hurts their money. So what you're saying is obviously happening. 
But why are people hesitant to have the conversation around the racism factor when it comes to dating? Yes, people are very, very defensive about being called out for their sexual preferences, have anything, having anything to do with racial preference. I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that we as Americans were very individually oriented and we think of our personal preferences as somehow separate from the public sphere and that the personal is not political and yet the personal is political is essentially what Damana was arguing in that and what we argue in our book. Uh, racial preferences continue to maintain the status quo and, and discrimination. For example, you know, when our book came out, I remember, I don't know if you're familiar with Campus Reform, it's a kind of a right wing student newspaper that's funded no. by a lot of, um, it's funded by a lot of uh, right wing uh, organizations. And uh, when they had a little piece on our book, which was, uh, came out on Valentine's Day and said, happy Valentine's, you're a racist. You know, that's how they summarize what our book said. Of course. Uh, but it, essentially, we're not arguing that individuals are racist for having a sexual preference. What we are arguing is that we live in a racist society. Uh, we live in a white supremacy. And so we are fooling ourselves to think that uh, just as race is a social construction, that our racial preferences are not also socially constructed and uh, are essentially imprints from centuries of racial marginalization. We live in a racial hierarchy, and we still do. Daters, I think it's just very aware for them to have awareness about this, to think about it, to ask themselves, why? Why do I have a, a racial preference? Often the white daters we interviewed were hesitant to admit racial preferences, although it would often come out later. These are two-hour interviews, so there are lots of ways of getting at different kinds of questions. But we would hear things like, uh, I, I did date uh, a Latino once, uh, but you know I found that he was really machismo, and so now I don't date Latinos at all. Right? So <laughs> like, you know, the, the one individual suddenly defines the entire race, right? And so uh, that that was kind of something common that we would hear. Or someone would say, oh, you know, I, a white person, um, I've never dated, uh, a, you know, a black woman before, but, you know, I would totally date Beyonce. Or a woman might say, I would totally date that, like, K-pop dude. So there's an exceptionalism at play there, for sure. Well, I think it's also about we get, we learn relationally, I believe. And so through these relationships that we have and through interactions that we have with people of different backgrounds, we start to form different opinions. So, you know, someone might say, well, you know, I don't deal with black people or like, I, you know, they have certain beliefs about black people, but they're like, oh, but my, my neighbor, Gary across the street, well, he's cool. Well, he's fine. Well, Beyonce, because, you know, I listen to her music and I see, you know, I've watched <laughs> Lemonade album, you know, whatever. Yeah. Now I have a different association with her. And so, you know, what I was arguing in the Washington Post piece, which was very controversial, I did get, I got a lot of hate mail, but I got a few people who said, Thank you for just opening my eyes to the fact that I have power in how, in, in what happens with culture as a whole. And I, I can personally choose to look at this differently and to look at the opportunity in forming a relationship with someone of a different background or even just exploring. Having, just having the conversation is what gets us there. But I think what the dissonance that's coming up is that people overall want to believe well, I'm not. I'm not racist. There was there was a Gallup poll that looked at approval of interracial marriages, and the most recent poll said 94% approve of interracial marriage between black and white. This is a huge difference from like prior to in 1958 when they first did this Ooh. did the study. Ooh. Only four percent. Yeah, right. Ooh. But Opposite. you know, it really wasn't that long ago. Just four percent of people said that they approved of black and white marriage. So we approve of it, but not necessarily for me. And so as communities open up and tools like online dating and social media allow us to have access to other cultures, other people who are different than, than us, we are learning and we're learning actually pretty quickly. The other thing about this piece that was interesting was that it was like a, me and Jessica formed like this union between two demographics that don't speak out for each other enough, which is Asian men and black mm. women. Like we didn't really um, have a chance to have each other's backs 
so to speak, uh, in many issues. But this was one thing where we were like, no, nah, screw this. And then we went to go <laughs> we went to go fight people about it. I always think of, uh, Roy did another piece on surprise, surprise racism. You did this early piece of Jordan Klepper about, uh, I can't remember what the- Least bias. Least bias, yeah. And one yeah. of the things I got away from that, that always stuck with me was this idea that when you accuse people of being racist, it, it really shuts down the conversation because it, people get defensive about it. Yeah, but, the but, other R word. Right, but if you just say, hey, you might be racially biased, it it kind of gives people a chance to talk about it, which ultimately is what we're doing right here because you can't force people to date people they don't want to date. It's not, the end of the day, it's something they have to decide inside. So if you're trying to change people's minds, if you're trying to extend an olive branch, you know the only way to do it is to meet them in a place where they're not, being accused of, you know, being awful people. The other aspect of this is that as an Asian man, for me to come out, I, you know, I love doing a daily show in these segments because we get to make fun of it and, and talk about serious issues. But for me to come out and be like, no one is, no one's dating me. This is disgusting. You guys are racist because you guys aren't dating me. You guys should date me. Like, not only is that weird, it's also off-putting and counterproductive, in my opinion, to the ultimate goal of trying to get people to date you. So that's why you're in this weird case 22. Wait, complaining about it, as a, I, I can't speak to black women, but I, I expect they have the same experience. As an Asian guy, complaining about it is counterproductive. So you can't even have a conversation. You just have to, like, deal with it and you know, and and you know the numbers kind of confirm um, uh, what I see in Western society a lot. Um, you know, a lot of Asian, a lot of uh, Asian people in in America are immigrants. Uh, not all of them, obviously. We've got eight generation, third generation Asian people, but the immigrant people who come, you can see like. You know, the the Asian daughters in the family all have like white husbands, and the the Asian men will have like. Asian wives, you know, and that's totally fine, but you, you see a trend coming, and some of that, I think, has to do with the social capital that you possess in the country, your, your ability to navigate the systems and be successful in institutions, you know, based on your language, based on your institutional knowledge of the place, and a lot of immigrants don't have that, and so therefore, they're, you know, they're, they're, their kind of worth in society is kind of de decreased uh, in a way, which which is... I think there's a correlation between that and the dating uh, stats that we see. That's such a great point. And one of the things that I always found really interesting about the data is that Asian American men on average um, have higher average incomes than any other racial group, including white men, which is yes. often uh, <laughs> is often Good. you know a parameter that women are looking for in a mate. And indeed, we interviewed plenty of women who actually are fully aware of this and had <laughs> preferences around Asian men. Um, and so when we talk about the statistics, that's a wholly different situation than the individual. And I will say that it was so fascinating to do the huge statistical overview and see some pretty sobering findings. And then to talk to individuals who, you know, may be one of these groups who statistically are ignored, but themselves have, you know, um, are pretty resilient and have have had success stories. Uh, they've it's just been a little harder. Resilient. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> they they kept with it. They kept with it. <laughs> That's right. They they hung in there. Let me ask you, Jennifer and Demona, Demona especially. You you tell me whether or not I'm a racist. Uh, you, you tell me whether or not I'm guilty of sexual racism. I am 43 years old. Every open, committed relationship I've ever been in has been with a black woman. I've had sex with other races, but if we're talking just straight up legit, yes, you are my girlfriend. Hey, everyone, this is my girlfriend. Hey, mama, meet my girlfriend. It's always been a black woman. I went out with a white woman one time, and we had some good-ass vibes. Went out a couple times, good-ass vibes. But I remember being out to eat, and as a black man, this was my first time being out with a white woman like this, and just, I could not keep my eyes off of whether or not people were watching us. That was thing one, the public perception of it. That made it uncomfortable. The other thing was, as I knew I wanted to have children, and this thought of, okay, if I'm raising what is essentially a black child, but he only has half of the pre-installed blackness at the house, can this woman help me usher this black child through circumstances that I'm not sure that she has experienced 
or can see from a perspective that will be beneficial to the upbringing because I can be kumbaya, but the world is not. So you know what? I like you, but I don't think we can date because people are looking at us weird in Applebee's and maybe I'm just being paranoid about that. But that was the only time that I've ever come close to dating interracially and I could not get past the kid aspect of that. Is that a factor in some people? Well, Roy. Ronnie, I see you looking at me. Roy, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> you suck, I'm man. Just, I'm just being You're honest, terrible. man. You're I'm being terrible. Being, uh, also, man, well, I can't tell if you're a good boyfriend or bad boyfriend. Because one, you care so much about what other people think instead of the person you're dating. Then I two, shouldn't have cared. <laughs> then, then two, you, you're, you're like it's extrapolating so far ahead about your kid in like when he's 10 years, he or she's 10 years old, what am I going to do? So you're both like, you're thinking. There's no dating algorithm that can tell me what her racial blind spots are. And no, I mean, that that's the was... whole point, though. Isn't that the point of dating? It's it's to be able to have those conversations and have those explorations. And look, I, it's not in your head, Roy. Like, I have had that same experience being somewhere with my white husband and being very aware people are looking at us or I'm feeling uncomfortable of uh, just being a person of color in that space. But it's something that I've chosen to walk through because the benefit is so much greater than all of those other challenges that I've I've had to go through. Having the relationship to me is worth worth more than that. But there was something in you said that was really interesting to me when you you said you've never introduced anyone other than a black woman to your mom. To me, that might be the the foundation of it is that these expectations are so deeply ingrained from family, from community, Why from culture. Why don't you bring no white girl in? This? <laughs> Not my mom, but there's a lot of black. And do you think being a byproduct of a black home, like how much of what we were raised in influences what we seek out in love? Because you talk about- I would about say a lot. I want to know what, what Jennifer has to say from her research though. I love how Demona's basically saying there's a lot of trouble, but the, the white privilege is worth it. <laughs> 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 She's like, look, no, there's a lot of issues about in the it, future, but... but <laughs> we're joking about end, it, but I feel privilege. like that, in a way, that is something also to examine. Like, anything plus white equals privilege in a lot. And so that is not it's in any way a factor in why I decided to partner. <laughs> but it is something... It is something to examine, and it is something, I will admit, Roy, that comes up in our relationship where there are blind spots that my husband has because he hasn't walked in my shoes. He hasn't had the experiences of being a black woman in America. And, and he is being, he's being educated by, by being mm -hmm. in a relationship with me and being encouraged to look at things through a different lens. Absolutely. I've heard, Roy, what, all the things you just said, I've heard that a lot. Um, and in fact, I remember when uh, Grindr, uh, after George Floyd's murder, removed their racial filtering categories because they realized that this is a problem. Mm. Most other dating websites have not. But there are a lot of folks in the Black community who really resisted that and spoke out to that and said, you know, I want to be able to find people within my own community. I don't want to lose that opportunity to be able to filter out, you know, people who objectify me or fetishize me who are of, you know, different races. I want to look for black men um, because we share, we know what it's like to be a black person in a, a very white society. Is that racist? I would argue that it's not. It's about uh, familiarity and survival and, you know, one thing that I always found really interesting, too, in some of our research is there's a, a very strong black love um, emphasis uh, within the black community. Um, you don't find that as much in the Asian community. And I think some of that has to do with the fact that, you know, the Asian American community is really, really heterogeneous. You have people from many, many generations and different countries, et cetera. And so there's not the same level of solidarity in the, a white world. Um, although I think that that's changing, uh, but that I, I think that you, the way you feel or the way you felt about that is completely legitimate, and I hear it from a lot of people. Ooh, all right, not racist, close, but not <laughs> quite all the way, but still a little bit of biases, a little bit of a blind spot. After the break, I want to talk about what are the other things that contribute to 
our biases when it comes to dating. Ronnie, thank you for joining us. I know you've got to bounce and go do important rich Asian man stuff. So I will leave <laughs> I got to go do some daily show stuff right now, okay? Well, the opposite that. of rich Asian man stuff. But thanks, <laughs> but thanks, uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's great to speak to you, um, experts who actually can back up what me and Jessica experienced or were researching from just a layperson's point of view. But um, I think the, the ultimate goal of all this is, as as uh, Jennifer and Demona were saying, is that, you know, you can't force people to date who they don't want to date. But I think the idea behind this conversation is to hopefully have people kind of ex- expand their horizons a little bit and open themselves up to dating other people in the hopes of increasing their chances of finding someone who they ultimately want to be with. That's That's the ultimate goal here. In my opinion, it's not trying to force people at gunpoint to date <laughs> to date uh, other you know whatever race they say they hate the the ultimate goal is i think personal happiness is is the reason why we're even having this conversation in my opinion but anyway uh, very it. nice to speak to all of you Thanks thank you me. beautifully said we'll be right back welcome back to beyond the scenes we are talking sexual racism and whether or not you just have a preference and that's what you're attracted to and it's not your fault or if you are a terrible person. (laughs) How much does the media play a role in what we desire? When you look at commercials and when you look at television shows, they've given us the mold of what they believe a desirable partner is, and more often than not, it's not an Asian man. And in a lot of instances, black women are in subservient roles in television. Like, you know, like, I don't even think there's been an Asian bachelor, if I'm not mistaken. But how much does the media play in informing our unconscious biases? Plays a huge role. And everything that we consume really influences the way that we move through society. You you mentioned Asian men in in media um, not being sexualized. And that was something that was very deliberate with Crazy Rich Asians, where they were positioning the cast to become sex symbols. And we actually saw, well, not only was the movie a huge success, and there was, there was a desire for that, but it really did seem to change some perceptions of of Asian men. And there's a long way to go in sort of leveling the playing field, but we, we've had a lot of these uh, images for so long. And like for black women, it was, you were either like the Jezebel or the Mammy. I know you've talked about, you know, the strong black yes. women on episodes before. And so this is something that a lot of black women carry as a fear when they go into online dating, that I'm either going to be seen as a caretaker or I'm being sexualized and, and fetishized. And I even, I hosted a show called Hashtag Black Love for FYI. It was a spinoff of Married at First Sight because there was so much passion around wanting to see black relationships. And on Married at First Sight in the first season, the only couple that didn't make it was the black couple. So everybody was like, we want black love. And and I've seen that in media, a lot of black networks or, or black outlets have have given the space for that because the more mainstream outlets are are not doing that. And that may also factor into a preference for black women wanting to continue to find black relationships and promote black love because that's it's not being reflected for them in mainstream content. I, I would agree. And I, I think the media is a huge part of perpetuating pre-existing stereotypical images, um, but also uh, producing them in many cases as well. I remember I used to always show this image to students. It's a little old at this point, but there's lots of examples since. Um, With Hurricane Katrina, there was a bunch of AP uh, images of people who were uh, basically wading in chest deep water. And one uh, showed uh, a couple of African-American folks uh, and it was uh, people looting whatever store. And another one showed, you know, white people with food that they'd gotten uh, from a store saying white people looking for food, et cetera, et cetera. And so you see just a very different. Yes. (laughs) Right. Survival. So you see this very different framing by race. And there's so much sort of gendered racialization around masculinity, hyper masculinity, 
or emasculation in the case of uh, Asian men, um, or passive lotus flower kinds of imagery around Asian women. And there's roots of this uh, that go way back in history that we talk a lot about in our book. What have been some of the victories? Give me some good news. Like, are you seeing a shift? Because people approve of interracial dating, but is it actually happening? Have you seen any type of shift in the dating trends, especially since COVID, when everybody was stuck at home and, you know, a lot of relationships did not survive COVID. So you probably had to be open <laughs> to a couple of more options back in those days. Yes, uh, people definitely were more um, experiential and more ex explorational <laughs> in their experiences. I mean, we saw also people were more open on on gender. We saw uh, people changing their preferences, their sexuality preferences. At OkCupid, we released 60 different gender and identity options so that people could find whatever they were looking for. So we did see a lot more flexibility. And we do see, looking at census data, now about 20%, one in, about one in six newlywed couples are with someone of a different race or ethnicity. So when you look at just 1958, only four people were approving of, this is specifically black, right, white um, intermarriage. Now we're at a place where there is actually a ton of intermarriage. And I think it's interestingly correlated actually with the rise in dating apps, because now we have access to different communities. And there is good news, like on OkCupid, black women are finding more success and okay. women identifying as black have been getting more matches in the past year. And it's higher than any time in the past three years. As I always like to do on this podcast and this part of the show, ladies, I like to try and talk a little bit about solutions and things that we can do to help change the problems that we've laid out so dutifully up until this point. Damona, I'll start with you. You know, as a dating coach, how do you encourage your clients to be race open? I guess that's the word. How do you encourage them to be race open while dating? How do you get them to put more, check more boxes of race? When they <laughs> well, my goal is not to make everyone date race open, though I see that as the best chance at them finding what they're looking for if they don't uh, put a restriction on race. But what I want them to do is to date from a place of authenticity and clarity. At the beginning of my dating coaching program, I always ask people about race. And I, I, I've always done this. It was surprising to me when I wrote the Washington Post piece to find that other dating coaches weren't necessarily doing this or were making assumptions that uh, people just wanted to date someone who came from a similar background. And we, I think as a whole, we make a lot of assumptions that someone with our skin color must have similar experiences or must have similar values or views on the world or would raise children in the same way. And I wanna get underneath all of that and really have people examine what their own beliefs are. So if they tell me that they only date someone of their, their race, I'll ask them why. It's actually a business technique. I do the five whys technique that was founded by Toyota to figure out why systems were not working. <laughs> I'll apply that to dating and I'll say, okay, well, why haven't you dated anyone of another race? Well, um, I just never, I never met anyone of another race. Well, why? Well, I never went outside of dating in my social circle. Why? And when we start to unpack that, you know, basically the answer to all questions is because racism. But that what I'm trying to get my clients to do is to to get them to understand these these factors that are impacting their preferences, the way that they date, and examine them and see what fits. Which part of this may be an expectation that maybe your parents had for you or that was ingrained yeah. by society and culture, and which yes. part of it really comes from a place of honesty and clarity for yourself and building the, the life that you want and the relationship that you ultimately want to have. I know that for me, if I'm just speaking about dating in my 20s, a lot of it was just rooted in the presumed un cultural unrelatability. You're a white girl. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to assume you don't like it's not like rap wasn't as pervasive into what like white people always listen to rap. But in the sense of, oh, if I said this rapper, this rapper, this rapper, she's going to know all of them. There was just this preconceived notion that there is a cultural divide too big for us to close for us to date. And that was always the assumption. And so I just never would, you know, just wouldn't, you know, if there was five white girls at a table and they had one black friend in my brain, I have to talk to her. 
I also wonder, Roy, how much of that actually comes from a place of fear of rejection. Like, I know this is something as a black woman and someone who's worked with a lot of black women, there's this fear that if, if, I, if I open myself up to this person who is different than me and they reject me, it's because I'm black. Was that ever a part of your thought process? No, it, but it never really gotten to, by the way, Jennifer, welcome to my free dating counseling session. I hope that you're enjoying this. Um, <laughs> It, it was never, I don't think it was ever rooted in that, but I do know that a part of it for me, if we're talking to your point about cultural upbringing, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, Birmingham proper, the Birmingham within the city limits is about an 80% black city. I did not have a white classmate until the sixth grade. And that was for a couple of months before I got transferred back to another predominantly black middle school. So my world was black, the black boys club. I went to black church. I hung out and played with black kids. My mama had black sorority sisters. I played with her friends. So whiteness was never culturally, that just wasn't a thing growing up. So when you get older and you become a man, you're kind of keying into a lot of that data that was, that, that software was already kind of pre, that behavioral software. I feel to a degree was probably already pre-installed. So you do have to overcome a lot of what your upbringing was to break out of that, to be race open. I've never been race, look, I've never said, eh, 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 no white girl, but it was always just a black woman and it just always felt like a quick and easier and simple fix. And I'm not saying that that was the right choice and I'm not saying that was the, always the right thing to do and that I couldn't have had a great relationship with the white girl from Applebee's, but that was more daunting than the fear of rejection. The fear of rejection, I do think that's real because it's also like, what, I'm black, I gave you a white ass a chance. <laughs> but it was definitely rooted in how will we relate to each other? And I don't know if we can, but you know, that idea is definitely something that is 20 years ago because, you know, the cultural divide isn't as big as it was. I've seen white people twerking. I think we've We've, we've come together. <laughs> we've all seen white people twerk. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, how much is on the dating companies, these, these dating app companies, to be more transparent about what they're doing, like with the algorithm? Do they owe us the right of transparency? And if they changed it, how would that impact the user experience? Yeah, I think our first instinct is to always go to the for the platforms and say, the platforms need to change, I need to do this and that. Given the fact that since 2013, the primary way that relationships start in the United States is through digital marketplaces, the dating market, that is a primary way now that relationships start. Why do we want corporations to be running this space? So that's one thing that we really unpack um, in this book, which is, are corporations, for-profit corporations, going to have an interest in bettering society and, you know, helping to eradicate racism? It's not necessarily profitable to do so. Surveillance capitalism is a big part um, of many platforms. You know, our, our data is sold to third parties. Um, and some of the data that we put in our profiles and the kinds of very intimate interactions we have online, that's incredibly lucrative. To companies, it's also incredible data to have on someone. I do have ideas. Lots of people have ideas on how platforms could improve, and I, I, I'd happy, I'd be happy to go over what some of those are. I think there are small changes, but I think that they could make a difference yeah, as well. Run them down. Run them down. Well, you know, I, like I love Damana's perspective on, um, you know, this very human perspective. We need to look in, inward. Um, that race has so little to do with finding a mate and. Uh, to really think about why we say we have racial preferences. I would love to see more of that kind of instruction or advice as part of the setup when people are creating their profiles. I think there's a lot of contextual data of, you know, just t pro tips from the platform that could in help daters as they put together their information. I also think, you know, we've talked about algorithms before, right? It would be great if, A, we at least knew what went into the algorithms, you know, so daters could say, oh, I want to go to a, you know, a, a platform that doesn't use race in the algorithm or doesn't use po uh, past racial behaviors as a way to then create what I see. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have experimented in, you know, small apps with a reset button for algorithms so that your past history doesn't influence 
how the algorithm continues. I also think it would be really useful for platforms to collect information on, you know, how many people flag others for, you know, racist uh, commentary um, to them as a data. And even, you know, this is probably going too far uh, by many people's perspectives, but being able to not just rate, say, someone's attractiveness um, and, you know, overall uh, your experience with them, but also to be able to say, uh, this person, you know, asked me if I like black chocolate and sent me a dick pic, you know, to be able to like yeah. have some kind of more like user mediated sanctioning, I think would be uh, a step. As someone who works with OkCupid, I think those are those are all great ideas. And I, I also want to remind people about, you know, personal, um, I don't want to say responsibility, but just how much personal uh, power they have to shift the way that the, the apps are in service to the user. Also, a lot of people don't use the tools that are already there to be able to block and report. And this is something that I'm always telling my Dates and Mates podcast listeners, if somebody calls you a racial slur, don't just get disgusted and turn off the dating app and say, I don't want to be here because someone said this thing. You need to report it. And we take, at, at OkCupid, we take those reports very seriously. And as you said, as reports like that line up, then we, and we see a trend, that's when an algorithm or a feature, a feature gets released or an algorithm gets changed. And just one last thing I'll say, what I also do with my clients is if they've experienced sexual racism, I encourage them to not internalize that or assume that means everyone on the app or everyone in dating or everyone of that culture to, to really Focus on the place that you're getting the love. So even as a black woman, I was able to find love on a dating app. And I'm not worried about the nine people that didn't write me back. I'm worried about the one that had the right kind of intention, shared my values and my goals for the future and those predictors of long-term compatibility. I've always yeah. wished that dating apps would at some point, based on the phone numbers that are tied to the account, form some sort of no-fly list, if you will, of racism and jerks and abusers and like anything of that nature. Like if you're no good on OkCupid, then you should be no good on every other site, Bumble, eHarmony, Match.com, all of them should ban you for acting a fool. You should be banished to Craigslist personals. You know what's happening? People are just like putting you on blast on TikTok. <laughs> like that's, <the laughs> that's West true. Elm Caleb, that's like good. he can't get a day ever again. Tinder yeah. swindler. <laughs> well, thank you all so, so much for the wonderful, wonderful conversation on this. I'm going to now log into a dating app like Ronnie and join all of them and see what happens. But again, I'm signing up Can I up help as, you, Roy? I want to help a, you. As a white male. I'm signing up as a <laughs> rich white man. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, bring me on that Date to Mates podcast. I'll talk to you. We'll figure Come out what through. the hell going on. Come we'll, through. I think, we, I, give me give me just like 20 minutes and <laughs> two apps I mean, and we're good. We find that white girl from Applebee's from 20 years ago and be like, hey, what's going on? Listen. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all so, so much for going beyond the scenes with me. Thank you. Thank you.